Welcome to Fishing Curious, beginning fishing Q&A with panelists from Confluence Collective. Um, this is a co-sponsored event with Treeline Review and Confluence Collective. I'm Liz Thomas, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from Treeline Review. I currently am on the lands of the Tonga in Southern California. Today, our panelists are from all over the U.S. and are here to discuss the how, the where, the what, the why, and the who of fly fishing. We're hoping this is a really lively discussion to talk about questions that we might have about fly fishing. Um, at this point, I would like to bring on Bree from the Confluence Collective to do a little bit of an introduction about the organization and um, to uh, the, our partnership on this event. I'm Bree. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. My home waters are in Maine, which are the unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. But here today, I'm in Montana. Um, and to talk a little bit about Confluence Collective, fly fishing has historically been a very exclusive space in outdoor recreation. And Confluence Collective is here to make sure that everybody has space to exist fully on the water and to build a relationship with nature through fishing. So we do this in a lot of different ways, uh, a lot of programming, access to education, but also having fun events like this where we get to collaborate with other people who are mixing things up in the outdoor space uh, and be working together on creating the culture that we want and need to be outside and feel comfortable and safe and like we belong. Uh, so that's the short and sweet version of it. Thank you so much, Bree. Um, and here at Tree Blind Review, we are a mission-based outdoor gear review website. Our goal is to help people buy right the first time, which is not only better for the wallet, and it's also better for the planet. And having the right gear and buying, right, buying your gear right the first time are two of the ways that we focus on removing the costs and the gatekeeping and barriers to entry in the outdoors. And also just in the way that we talk about the outdoors in our writing, um, we don't use bro language. We really try to create an inclusive space where people can feel comfortable learning about the outdoors um, and having their questions answered. All right, so the fun part is talking with our panelists. Um, um, Cade, why don't you take it away? Introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. My name is Cade Cloverdance. Um, I'm in Colorado. Oh, sorry, my, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm in Colorado, fish mostly on the Gunnison and Colorado River, which is the ancestral stolen lands of the Ute. Um, it's where I do almost all my fishing. Uh, I know I look like the typical fly fisherman as a white male, but I am a disabled person who's in a wheelchair full time. Um, so my challenges getting to the water are, are kind of unique. So I feel like that's kind of the voice that I can bring to this is how it feels to try and get on the water when it's not really made for you to be able to. So hopefully I'll be able to answer some of your questions and yeah, looking forward to it. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Eben Charles, uh, he, him, his pronouns. Um, I am a student at Bowdoin College, and um, my home is in uh, Waterville, Maine. Um, and so I do a lot of fishing on the Kennebec River. Um, that's the stolen land of the Wabanaki people. And yeah, um, I kind of come to this um, this Zoom call kind of as a person that typically isn't really represented in fishing and, and specifically in uh, the fly fishing community um, as a, a person of color. And so I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Bree, you already gave an introduction to Confluence, but will you and Serene, who are in the same location right now, uh, take it away? Sure. Uh, so I'm usually fishing in Maine. I grew up in the Maine woods. I started fishing when I was really, really young, doing more traditional kind of stuff. And then as I got older, I built my relationship more around fly fishing. Um, I'm a Maine guide, so I take people out to a lot of the time for their first experiences outside and then host a lot of workshops, um, facilitate education kind of stuff. Um, I write, I draw, and generally like being outside, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Serene? Hi, I'm Serene, she, hers. I uh, was born and raised on the stolen lands of the Bitterroot Salish, Ponderé, and Kootenai people here in Missoula, Montana. Um, I will say that I've been fly fishing since I was in high school, um, which is a long time and I'm still probably the eldest noob of them all. I'm a self-identified fat person. I hold the identities of a queer individual as well. And so my role and goal in life is to get other fat people outdoors and not waiting around to get skinny. Thank you so much, Serene, and Gabatia. 
Thanks so much, Liz. Hola a todos. I'm Gabacha Moreno. I use pronouns uh, she, her, ella. I, what else are we sharing? Oh, I'm tuning in from the ancestral lands of the Pueblo and Jicarilla Apache peoples in northern New Mexico. I get to fish so many waters here all year round, and I'm just really grateful of the kind of access that we have in the Rio Grande, in the Red River, um, the Rio Pueblo, um, the Pecos. There's just so many opportunities, and I really just started fly fishing about three years ago. I would say if I started fly fishing three years ago, I started catching fish two years ago. <laughs> it took a bit, it took a minute, um, but I, I was privileged to have grown up uh, fishing with nets and um, spin rods. And so fishing has always been part of my life. I don't remember my first time fishing because I was probably that young, but it's so fun to now get into fly fishing and, and being a little more technical in different ways about it and just having the wonderful opportunities to connect with all of this group of humans here. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Gavatia. So for our first question, um, I think this is something that you all probably have, have strong opinions about, and that is, is fly fishing even okay to start as someone who's never done any fishing at all? Um, and the very important question, what is fly fishing? I could give a very general kind of definition uh, in terms of what fly fishing is in comparison to other forms of fishing. Uh, a difference between spin casting or traditional fishing and fly fishing is that we're using the weight of the line itself to be propelling the fly forward. So in fly fishing, we're using a lot these little flies or lures that are tied with things like fur and feathers and other fibers and wire to look like something that fish want to eat. And that can be on the surface of the water. It can be under the water. There's a lot of different techniques that you can be using, but for it to be fly fishing, that line itself is what's pushing that fly out there for the fish to interact with. And hopefully you get to meet them at the end of it. Um, compared to spin casting where the weight of the lure itself is what's pushing your your lure out there to where the fish are living. And I would say it's a really great way to start fishing. Um, I think everyone's access point depends on what is available to them. For me, uh, I had borrowed gear and I used spin casting because that was what was available. Um, but that also didn't preclude me from starting fly fishing or learning something different um, and getting excited about that. I'm happy to share my thoughts as, um, you know, as a child, I was curious about the flies for fly fishing. And my dad told me that that's too difficult. I honestly think that it's like, I don't think there's like a best thing to get started fishing because each style of fishing is so uniquely different from each other that like, even though the, maybe the goal is to catch fish, the method is like, so different from one to the next. So like, if you can get started with a spin rod, like go for it. If you can get started with a net and it's legal to use it where you are, go for it. If you can start with a hand reel, those are really fun and very lightweight if you like to fish in the backcountry. Or if you have a tenkara or a, or a fly rod, I think it really doesn't matter. It matters that you find um, a medium that you feel connected with and that it motivates you to, to keep chasing fish, I guess. That's awesome. So I guess the next question is, um, now that we know that, that fly fishing is an accessible form of fishing, where do you go to learn more about fish? Where do you start? Um, where, where do you find where your local fish are and what they are? I think it starts with just asking the questions and, and starting to understand that in order to uh, catch fish, you have to go where fish live, which is bodies of water. Um, and arguably there's not every body of water holds fish, but you would be surprised where fish live. They live both in urban settings and remote settings. They live high in the mountains. They live maybe in the backyard stream that you've always just assumed didn't hold fish. Um, a great place to start asking questions is amongst community like the one that we've created here, Googling things and even finding yourself um, into shops that might sell uh, different types of fishing gear. And so it doesn't necessarily have to look like a fly shop, um, but it could be even a bigger box store or a bigger sporting goods store 
they do have the product. They should know questions about um, what that is going to look like and where to get started. Um, I think that it's a constant state of knowledge to be in. And, and the more you go, the more you understand the location that you're going um, and you, and you can get better and better at knowing where to target fish. Yeah. So I, I grew up in Maine. And so those are, um, you know, Maine rivers, that's where I fish quite a bit, specifically the, um, the Kennebec river. Um, I know that when I started getting into fly fishing specifically, um, I'm pretty new to fly fishing. I've actually only caught, I think like less than 10 fish on a fly rod. So I'm, I'm very, very new. Um, but when I first started like learning about it and, um, you know, places to catch fish and stuff, I use Google maps quite a bit, actually. I, um, I would kind of hop onto Google Maps on like my iPhone, um, or I'm sure there's other apps too if you have like an Android and stuff like that. Um, and I just tried to find like different spots that might look good for fishing, um, typically just like open water, that kind of stuff. And also um, I try to talk to people. Um, usually when you're at a spot, you might find fishermen there too um, and know some, some decent spots for fly fishing or stuff like that. And that's kind of how I got started. Okay, so the one I wanted to add real quick is and I know that these vary from state to state, but your parks and wildlife place is always a great place to start, whatever your state website is, because almost everywhere, and I won't say everywhere, but almost everywhere, you have to have a fishing license to go fishing, which you have to get from your state. And that's a great resource to not only because you need to get the license to be able to go fishing, period, whether you're going to keep the fish or not, but also that will have a list of places that they stock. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, they, they literally grow rainbow trout and other kinds of trout in hatcheries and dump them into certain bodies of water. They will tell you when they're doing that on these websites so you know when there's going to be fish in places, especially when you're first learning. Like, yeah, it's awesome to go catch a wild fish in a wild place, but when you're first learning, going to a stocked pond that's local to you or on in a state park is a great place to go and learn what you're doing and especially you have really good odds of catching things in those places because they stock them with fish. Thanks so much Kate and that's actually a great segue for another question we had on how to build confidence learning to fly fish. This actually came in from um, the Eventbrite um, sign up form. Someone asked how do I how do I build confidence learning to fly fish when I don't know anyone locally to teach or learn from? Jen. Yes, put me on the spotlight. I say just get comfortable sucking at it. I cried so much, y'all. My first year, I was like, I, you know, I've watched the videos. Like, my partner is like a prodigy fly fisherman. So, like, he will like guide me through, like, hold my hand, tell me what I'm doing wrong, like, all the things, right? And like, I still wasn't catching fish because I was either too slow or too fast like you just see all the fish running away from you and you're like what am I doing wrong and it really is it's just whatever you just have to be graceful about whatever your own learning curve is and like enjoy those tears and stuff <laughs> getting skunked for years not fun but like I all I'm gonna say is that if you persist and commit to continue one day you'll catch a fish and then you realize that you catch another fish the next day and suddenly you're catching fish and it's all fun and games. Finally, it's worth it. <laughs> but it's just getting used to sucking and enjoy, enjoying that you have a journey to, to take on, to learn, to see yourself grow and like to get frustrated at yourself and the gear and get tangled in all sorts of weird ways. But it's growing. It's the growing pains. I think some of those growing pains even exist like between not having a fish on your line or not having the expectation that there's going to be a fish on your line. And then all of a sudden, when you do catch a fish, it feels very discombobulated. And by it, I mean me and like everything's everywhere. I only have two hands. I'm then trying to find my net to find wh where to put my rod. I'm trying, I'm wishing at that point I was an octopus and, uh, trying to get the fish somewhere manageable. You know, we, we talk pretty heavily about fish handling, which is super important. And there's also moments in time where we just have to try to do our very best. Um, and so I think learning, learning that step of, of setting the hook and having a fish on, and also understanding that part of fishing is losing fish when they are on the hook and not having the full chance to meet them. But if you know that there's a fish on the end of the line, you caught a fish, 
So be very confident in that, that you're doing something right. Um, it can feel hard to, um, go to the same place over and over, but you do learn as you're going. Um, another good adage is, is don't leave fish to find fish. So if you see fish or you hear fish, or you you feel like you caught one on the end of your line that you weren't able to get in your net, kind of staying there and staying focused because there's a lot more fish in the water than you would think. And I think even before you're meeting fish, confidence for me was being able to make sense of where I was and how I could be interacting there. So there is something to be said for spending some time in a space and getting to know the way that the water is flowing, getting to know how your fly is moving in that water and slowly making that progression of getting the fly even closer to where you want it to be uh, each time that you're casting and keep practicing over and over again. I think I started doing that rather than uh, getting really caught up in the fish itself. And eventually the fish caught up with me because I started doing the right thing better and better. Mm -hmm. So just keep practicing, keep paying attention to what you can and how your movements are shifting the environment that you're in. And eventually when you're doing that in a way that looks like food to a fish, you get to meet them. So here's a question. Um, even before you go out and get to the water, um, this also deals a little bit with knowing what sort of sorts of uh, waterways are near you, what sort of fish are, are near you. What sort? The question is, what sort of seasoned rules, permits do I need to know or licenses do I need to get before I fish? Uh, is there a website that lists it all out? Does this change depending on where I live or even the waterway I want to fish? All right, so a very rules-based question. Um, Gabachia is nodding ahead with a lot of thoughts on this. So I'm going to bring Gabachia on. Okay, um, yes. Just because like it, it really varies by state, but it also varies by access point. It varies by section of river. I mean, you just got to know before you go. And the only way to know is doing research. And sometimes, unfortunately, I'm not going to lie, the... Even the government agencies don't have the <laughs> information that you seek. So uh, the way I approach those kind of like gray zones is like when in doubt, single hook, um, no barb and catch and release only. Like that's when I can't tell, like when the, the signage is like destroyed or, um, or, you know, worn out from the weather and the website didn't really say much or you called and the person that picked up the phone, they have no idea what fishing is. And like, you have to deal with those moments. So like, I just, all I want to offer right now is my go-to when, when in doubt, like single hook, barbless and catch and release only. And when I say single hook is like, you know, how some flies have two hooks, just make sure your fly only has one hook or sometimes you can um, connect another fly. Like I just try to keep it single. And then also barbless is like the barb is the little thing that pokes out of the hook so that it really catches the fish. When we practice catch and release, we try to go barbless or push, pinch the barb down so that it's easy to release, release the fish without hurting it um, in the way that it would get hurt with the barb. So I hope that helps. When Gabachi is talking about different places having different regulations, uh, that's very true. In Maine, we have native brook trout that are very protected. And depending on what other fish are in that waterway or where you're accessing, um, there's going to be different ways that you should be interacting with them in order to protect the resource and protect them as uh, an ecosystem or part of an ecosystem. So as much as like the state government doesn't always have all the answers, it is a good place to start. And then there are great resources like Take Me Fishing that can put you in touch with more uh, information, more education, and, and also just finding if there's any community groups around you, uh, either virtually or in person. I know most things are virtual at this point. Um, so being able to connect to the local community and get in touch with uh, what information is available there is a great way to start. I think that it, I think just hitting on all these points can sound super complex for fly fishing. And that's one of the biggest pieces of, of people that are, are new to the sport or even dreaming about starting the sport is that it feels so hard to get into and and at the same time it isn't and so there are places that are accessible more than others and so in the learning realm kind of 
identifying those and just starting there. And then as you build your community, branching out and not feeling like you have to bite off more than you can chew at the very first time. Thanks so much. And I agree. I think especially for people who um, identify with more marginalized backgrounds, these licenses and rules and this government stuff it can be really, really intimidating. So I appreciate all of your perspectives on how to go about managing that. So now for kind of a fun question, um, gear, which I'm, I know that everyone loves to talk about quite a bit. Um, so there are a lot of questions on what's the absolute minimum as far as gear that I need? What's the gear in the simplest form that I need to get? Um, a lot of questions about do I need waders? Do I need uh, other expensive gear? Um, what are your thoughts on the best um, first fly fishing a rod, um, cheap beginner rods, th those sorts of questions have come up. I would actually love to hear all of your um, thoughts on this. Sure. So I think um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of gear available and you don't need it all to get started. Uh, ultimately, fly fishing is just getting a fly onto the water. And I know when I first started accessing the water, I was doing so from shore. I never got wet really, besides when I was touching the fish itself. Um, so all I needed was a rod with line and a fly on the end of it. Um, that's something too, where depending on where you are, you could probably get away with doing that almost all the time. In Maine, um, we do a lot of fishing by canoe or by float tube. So that's something that changes the gear that you might need in that scenario. So uh, for example, I don't need waders if I'm fishing from a boat, that's helpful. Um, but I can also find like a rock to perch on from shore and just get a fly out on the water that way. Um, and even you're still pretty new in fly fishing. I'm curious what it's been like getting out there for you. And I know you're building your gear repertoire. So how are you getting out there? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And yes, I have been, uh, you know, building my my gear inventory. Um, actually, I think my first pair of waders, um, I really don't think you need waders to get started fly fishing. When I first got my first pole, I bought it from L. Bean. Um, it was like a super, super beginner rod. Um, although they do have some at like Walmart and stuff too. Um, I was just practicing and stuff in my my backyard, just on the, the lawn and stuff. And so I didn't really go, you know, near water um, until, um, you know, after practicing that and stuff. But um, I got my first pair of waders um, actually at a yard sale for like $30. So there's actually quite a bit you can do to kind of find gear uh, that's like secondhand, um, not necessarily new, but it definitely gets the job done. Um, but yeah, I would recommend looking through those kind of outlets too, maybe Facebook Marketplace, that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, and in terms of the actual rod as well, for those who are looking for like, all right, I'm ready to go, I wanna get out there. Um, we wrote, we're trying to build out more of these gear reviews with Treeline over time. And we wrote a good beginner, fly fishing kit, what you should be looking for piece. So that's something that you can find on the Treeline website, but ultimately depending on where you are, changes what you need for gear. Um, across the board, a general recommendation is something called a five weight, uh, nine foot rod, which just talks about like how heavy that rod is and how big the fish that you're gonna catch with it are. Um, so that kind of rod is something that you can be using in most rivers and some still water. And then depending on if you're fishing creeks versus if you're fishing like the Missouri, um, that changes the gear that you might need. But a lot of companies are now offering beginner kits, which include everything like your beginner reel, a rod to put it on, line on that reel, and then some like clear part that goes on the end that the fish aren't going to see as much, which is your, your tippet and your leader. Um, so that information all available on the website. And also you can ask people in your local community what they got started on as well. Um, mine was borrowed and it was great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bree. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Um, to build off this question, Kate, is there any additional gear you find particularly helpful when making fishing more accessible? Uh, gear wise, I, I I mean, this is higher on the end of things, but being able to get into a boat is really nice for somebody that's not, doesn't have the ability to walk, frankly. I mean, so if you have that as an opportunity, that's really cool. If not, if you're in your chair, um, I would say that you're, you're, again, Google Maps is your friend because you can, or uh Google Earth or whatever it is, because you can actually look at the bank and see where there are 
dirt spots that you can see go down to the water and give yourself a good idea of whether or not you can physically go out there. Friends, people to take you out is obviously really helpful too. I, I rarely fish on my own. I mean, it sucks. I'd love to fish whenever I wanted to, but I often go with other people because I just never know unless I've been to a spot before. Um, but in general, for, for the, what we were talking about here, another thing I wanted to add, not to throw everybody off, but you can fish flies with traditional gear too. So if you've got traditional gear and you're like, I want to try fly fishing, but you're not ready to purchase a fly rod and all that, you can absolutely fish a fly off of your old spinning gear or anything else that you've got just to experience that uh aspect so i think that's an awesome way to start because i promise once you catch a fish on the fly you'll be addicted and want to buy all the gear and everything but you can do it that way you don't need to get everything at once but i totally agree with what Bree and serene were saying there are kits available now you can definitely go to walmart and places like that and get something really cheap but i recommend going to one of the companies that does this as their living and buy a beginner kit because it will last you a lot longer and you won't outgrow it as soon. Orvis, Reddington, uh, there are a bunch of companies. We can definitely give a list of companies that have beginner kits that are at a price point that won't, you know, make you pass out when you see the price tag. So you, from an accessibility standpoint, I think it's interesting. The net that you choose to use has a super long handle. Why don't you talk about that a little bit different more? Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, this is a whole different little ball game, but I'm a catch and release fisherman only. And for anyone that doesn't know, that literally means every fish that I catch, my intention is to get it back into the water safely to live the rest of its days. I don't ever keep fish. Uh, so one of the things that I found very difficult, and thanks for bringing this up, Serena, is that when I get to the water often, I'm pretty far away from the actual water itself on the bank. So I had a net, and I was lucky enough to have one made for me, but you can definitely get these at any kind of boating fishing place, a very, very long net, longer than you would ever think you need. Like my net's over three feet long, in the handle and then the hoop itself is probably another 20 or 24 inches. So it's like a five foot long net. And that's to give me that ability to reach out into the water that I can't necessarily get to, or that's not safe enough to get to with the wheelchair. Um, so yeah, that is a, a piece of gear that specifically for somebody in a wheelchair is a very helpful thing to invest in. So. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Anybody with mobility issues could could in, could benefit from longer nets. Yeah, it, it, you know, I didn't want to get into the weeds with this, but I will really quickly say if there is anyone that you know of or if you're on the call and I'm a paraplegic, I have full use of my arms and hands, but for anyone that doesn't, there are systems. There's a company called Rexfly that makes a setup that attaches to your chest that allows you um if you're quadriplegic to, to be able to fish. It does some of the work for them. The, the actual rod detaches from the reel so that it's not all one setup and, and it can be strapped to the hands. There's a lot of different adaptations that can be made to get people on the water that otherwise wouldn't be able to. So like I said, I just didn't want to get into the weeds with that, but please, anybody that wants follow-up stuff on that, after this is over, contact Liz, contact whoever and get my information. And I'm definitely happy to go and dive into the weeds with you on that stuff. Thanks so much for that, Kate. And we will follow up with an email for all of the attendees with your contact information, all the panelists' contact information and Instagram. So you'll be able to follow them um, and get in touch if you have questions. Um, there actually was an, a, another follow up question on gear um, for Serene on gear for bigger women, especially waiters. Yeah, I think that we, you know, are still kind of uh, new here. I don't know why it shouldn't be this way, but it is. And so um, oftentimes there are options uh, for people are plus size um, at some of the the big box stores that are are made for men I'm, uh, or 
men, uh, males assigned at birth. And the problem with those is that the feet are really big or they're not, they're not cut for you. Um, a company that I work amongst is called Miss Mayfly and they do make waiters for bigger bodied, um, people that have more curves and voluptuousness than the classic male cut. And so more room in the hips, more room in the chest, more room in the waist, um, definitely more fitting in the booties. Um, they are an investment. And so recognizing that your waiters don't have to fit perfectly when you're just getting started. Um, and Miss Mayfly um, continues to change their product. It seems like annually at this point in, in a positive way, making growth in the direction of, of more feedback. Um, the other option is to wear as a plus size person, like muck boots, which my, honestly, I blew my waders out this uh, fall. And so I was in muck boots that are like rubber boots that come up to my knees. It's just a safety thing, right? So um, if you choose to not have, if it's not a choice, but you don't have waders and it's winter, you do have to be aware and cognizant of temperature of the water and um, how you interact with that. And so um, I would, I would point people in that direction or coming up with, with gear that other companies make just for being outdoors. Um, they, they have some options of, of waterproof type things. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think I got it on that. I don't know. It's hard. So. It's frustrating. Great. We're pinned in the corner. There's only one company that makes them particularly for us and they do only go up to about a size 28. And so if you are a woman wearing bigger than size 28, that, that is, that's a barrier that we're still working on. Thank you for sharing that Serene. Um, there's a few questions that have come in about Alpine Lake fishing, fishing on a through hike or on a backpacking trip. Um, I know this is something that I, we've, I've personally talked quite a bit with Gabachi about. So uh, I think this is <laughs> Gabachi's wheelhouse question. Um, would you mind sharing what your thoughts are on this, Gabachi? I want to, because I forgot to say this during the beginner gear conversation, something that Kate said about like, you know, you can buy the cheapest rod or you can buy like from a brand that's dedicated to more fishing gear. And the difference in that, because personally, like the first rod that we bought in our house was the Walmart rod that was like $60. And while that served a purpose, it like, I mean, when I, when I think about it, it was probably a waste of money at the end of the day, because a hundred dollars later, I continue to use my beginner like encounter or this outfit that cost $170. Right now it's on sale for a hundred. So go get it. Um, but I have been fishing with that for three years or two years. Oh my gosh. It's all blurring in my head now, but you know, so like it may be, you know, if, if you can find it online in one of those places where you can do the deferred payments, like it's probably going to be worth it. If this is something that you actually see yourself doing in the long run. So I just wanted to add that perspective because that was my my personal experience on that beginner gear. Um, and then about the alpine lake uh, fishing, um, I think it's really fun to be um, honest. I've um, only been on two quote unquote successful back, uh, <laughs> back country lake fishing trips. The first one was with my spin rod and I caught so much brook trout. I like didn't know what to do with it at the end of the day, but it was fabulous because that one time we came prepared to like cook it and it was um, a possibility in that specific lake. I believe it was in the Rocky Mountain National Park. I don't, I don't remember. It was, it was near the Rocky Mountain National Park. It was, I think it was the forest, but you entered through the park and then you got to the forest. I don't know. It was something like that, but you know, it was fabulous. It wasn't even that long of a hike. I think it was like maybe six miles in, you were at the Alpine Lake, uh, you know, we, we brought some oil and some tortillas to make burritos. And it was just like as fabulous as backcountry food gets. Um, and that time I, we, we fished with the spin rods and I also brought a hand reel and the hand reel has become like my favorite thing to bring into the backcountry because it's so easy. It's li literally just, I wish I, I should have had it here at hand, but it's kind of like a circle like this 
and it has a side where, um, you know, it has a side that has a stop. So the line doesn't go that way. It goes this way and it's all wrapped in. And then you kind of like just get some motion going and throw it out into the water. And then like slowly you have to fill it up and uh, fill it out and you see the fish chasing your little lures and it's super fun. Um, it, I think that's just like one of my favorite pieces of beer. I also brought that hand reel whenever I did the Collegiate West in Colorado. And um, while I did not catch like, well, I think I had one bite, but I also didn't bring but one lure, which you should probably bring a couple if you really want to fish. I was just more like, I don't know. This is my first backcountry by myself. I don't know if I'll be fishing or not. So it was like very undecided. Um, so then I actually had to hike in again to one of those same lakes because I was like, I'm going to get those freaking beautiful greenback cutthroats that Colorado has. And so like I actually went back with my fly rod like the next day after I exited the trail and I caught some. Um, but, you know, it's just like, obviously, don't be like me. Bring more than one lure if you actually want to go fishing. Uh, bring the cooking supplies if you're if you're serious about cooking it in the backcountry. I think there's just not a better meal that you could have if you like to eat fish of course um and then my my last uh, success story was actually with Bree we went to Yellowstone National Park this past summer and I had been there before uh two years prior when or three years prior when I had started fly fishing that like you know admittedly I didn't catch anything for a year so one of my trips I, you know a month after I learned to fly fish I went back country fly fishing in Yellowstone yeah right um, but I think obviously like coming back two years later uh, Brie and our friend Ileana came along and we all we all got to meet a couple of uh, Yellowstone cutthroats and those are the most beautiful fish. We did not eat them. I actually don't know if you can eat them. I'm assuming yes, but maybe not. No, I don't know. I don't know because we were just going to catch and release. So that's that was the plan. But it's um, it's fun. I think it's you just have to be very mindful of the additional weight that it requires to to go backcountry fly fishing if that's something that you're interested in definitely the first time that I did it my non-fly fishing gear was already heavy so like adding the fly fishing stuff also like um it might not feel it might not seem like this stuff weights but like when you're backpacking and it's on your back you re it really does so I think it's just about being mindful about you know yourself how you feel how much weight you can carry um, on top of your own and then just um, figure out also what's achievable um, I think when we did the backcountry this past summer maybe it was pushing our limits a little bit but we made it and that was it was it was good to be in a crew because we were cheering each other up through the like um, realities of being near the water at sunset like clouds of mosquitoes attacking you as you're hiking and so on and so forth so you know that to say is like I can romanticize it all I want there were also leeches and my foot got infected I mean you can be you can go through a lot of stuff I yeah I would just say it just builds your character and it keeps challenging you and it's I think it's like a beautiful next um, step to try if if you're Especially if you're already into backpacking and you start fishing, I feel like naturally you're going to want to bring that along with you on a, on a back, backcountry trip. I'd love to do a, like a self-sustained backpacking through Alpine Lakes or something like that someday, but then I will really have to prepare for that. <laughs> Real quick, I just wanted to say there's a really cool fly rod. It's by a company called Rayer. It's R-E-Y-R -E gear. Dot com that is an all enclosed telescoping fly rod that like that's what they designed it for like the you'll just have to look online but it's r-e-y-r gear.com and they make it specifically for backpacking and trips have you there. tried those kate i have and here's my only you can't cast it as far as you can a, a regular fly rod mm -hmm. but you can cast a lot farther than you can a Tenkara rod and you get more of an actual fly fishing feel from it, I think, than you do with a Tenkara 
rod. And for anyone that doesn't know, a Tenkara rod is a collapsible rod also that comes out, becomes nine, 10, 12 feet long. And then the line is just connected to the tip. It doesn't actually go to a reel or anything else. It's literally like, think about it like a pole with a line on the end of it. But, uh, you know, carbon fiber and a little more advanced than that, but you're using a stick with a line tied to the end. But this Ray gear is, is an actual fly fishing gear that is made, like they, the guys who invented it did it for bike, uh, for bike, fishing trips to be able to attach to their bicycles and ride their mountain bikes out into the woods and go fishing. So just wanted to throw that part out there as far as gear goes. Thanks, Kate. Uh, the next question has to do with lures, bait, flies. Um, the question is, where do I get bait? Should I look for worms? Um, who would like to take this question? I think in most areas, if you're getting out for traditional fishing, um there are still like bait and tackle shops that you can go to and find worms or you can like dig up a little bit of earth and look for something under the under the surface um for flies honestly i've found more i've really appreciated being able to build a relationship with fly tires personally and order flies that way that way i know where they're coming from and um, I can be supporting someone very directly, uh, like my buddy Marco Kamura is so good at tying flies and you can just order a bunch from his website. Um, there are fly shops, that's a really traditional kind of space, and I think depending on what identities you hold, that can be a good option or it can be a really uncomfortable option. Um, even me and my white skin can be uncomfortable um, to try to be taken seriously and find what I want. So again, being able to look outside of those traditional spaces, even just finding people on Instagram or, you know, in those community groups that are near to you uh, that are tying flies. Uh, Serene hosted fly tying night with the Missoula Fly Gals. Like you can be building out the resources that you want um, and be connecting with people who are doing so in less traditional ways. Um, but like short answer, go online, Google where to find those. <laughs> and you can also be finding people within your community to help answer that more specifically to what you need. Yeah, I think that also there's different types of flies. And so in fly fishing, you're using flies that um, don't always look like a house fly. So um, when, we're, when we're talking specifically about fly fishing, there's flies that Say on the top of the surface of the water, that would be called a dry fly. And the subsurface flies, um, there's uh, really heavy sedentary flies. Those are called nymphs. Um, up from that in the water column, hopefully maybe, would be a fly that you're moving or making it look like um, bait of some kind. That's called a streamer. And then there's also flies that are called wet flies that look like bugs that hatch. So um, and I guess there's a half on the surface, half under the surface mm -hmm. called, called an emerger, but we'll hold, we'll hold on to that because those are kind of frustrating, but I think, um, a good place to start there's, there's, uh, asking question of what's hatching. So, um, you can go fishing all day long with a caddis fly. Um, it's just a dry fly that looks like a little moth. And if, only mayflies are hatching, you're never going to catch a fish. And so it's asking the, you know, there's kind of hatch calendars or hatch charts that you're kind of asking people as you go through. So again, that resource coming back to community, um, but the flies under the water, the nymphs fish eat 85 to 90% of their food subsurface. And so that's kind of a good way to start. And um, I'm probably talking further ahead than I need to. I sometimes speak fishy, so I need help on that, but sorry. Thank you, Serene. Um, Brie, you know, one of the things I really liked about what you said is the challenges of being a person from a traditionally underrepresented in fishing background. Um, and the question is, I feel uncomfortable going to a fly shop, especially in a rural area that I don't normally visit. What recommendations do you have to get the local intel um, flies that you one would normally hope one could get at a fly shop, but maybe doesn't feel comfortable doing so. Oh, I can start. I have white passing boyfriend, so he can get me all I need at the fly shop. Um, but 
<sighs> you know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's like, it, for me also, especially like coming in with my white partner, it's like, it's always the assumption that like, he's the one there to be service, right? And so, but also I feel like as a woman of color, I just build this kind of tough skin about this stuff and just like feel a little bit of empathy, a little bit of pity for the people that are not aware enough to, to be more inclusive and welcoming in their spaces. It definitely sucks. Um, but to me, it's just like, I gotta brush that stuff up. If I, know, if I thank goodness, know what I need, it's easy if I need to ask for help. Um, you know, it, it works. I have never had like a terrible experience where I was like, oh my gosh, these people didn't wanna like sell me or didn't wanna talk to me or anything like that. But you can also, I mean, I remember the first time I went to a fly shop by myself and I was really lucky that the, it was owned by a woman and that she was there. Um, and so that, that felt like, for, for me, like walking into a fly store, it was already like, oh, nice, okay, a woman, we have something in common, that's great. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, I wish I had more to offer. It's it's a wild world out there. And I think that as people from the communities that we're from, we kind of know what to expect. But I also, I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And I always enter a space, um, A, knowing that I belong and owning that I belong. I'm a patron, I have money, and I'm choosing to leave it here. And so that deserves attention and service. Yeah, I would say I agree. Um, I do. I know when I started too, I went to Ella Bean quite a bit um, and was buying flies there and stuff. That just, um, or yeah, I would I would kind of like look at some stuff on YouTube and find a couple of flies that I thought looked really cool. Um, and yeah, I'd go to Ella Bean and buy it there. Um, I, as far as recommendations for people that maybe don't feel safe doing that or don't feel as comfortable doing that. Um, I know that's something else I do uh, quite a bit too. Um, I'll even go to like Walmart. Um, they don't have like the best flies, but they're pretty cheap. And so um, uh, a great option too is just going to Walmart and then um, you can pick up the flies and go through a self-checkout. Um, I think that's a pretty decent option. Um, if maybe you're just self-conscious um, or if you've had like a, a negative experience, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that would, that would be my advice. I really like that. And I want to bring back to it because what I found too is that those bigger stores that have the little fly fishing section that's easy because you're not gonna have like a full-time potentially snob person that knows too much about it so maybe there's just someone that like attends the whole fishing section and like they know a little bit about everything and so that tends to be a little friendlier or more um welcoming space like i've had decent um, experiences at like a Cabela's or like a sportsman's warehouse, uh, that kind of, that's those kinds of spaces. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing those experiences. Um, I think we've got about um, 10 minutes left. So I wanted to bring Sarah Burtis on from um, Confluence Collective to address um, some of the questions. Um, so I'll let Sarah take it away. Sure. Um, so Jamie asked, uh, could anyone talk a bit more about catch and release? I hear conflicting things about it being harmful to fish, especially in areas that are well fished and one fish could be caught multiple times, especially when fish are endangered or protected. They get caught up with the ethics of fishing. Um, I know Gabachia mentioned she could speak to that. Um, I'd love to hear from her. Something that I found really helpful is uh, the educational resources from organizations like Keep Fish Wet. Um, the, they give you some best practices that are based on what's best for the fish themselves and the fish species themselves. So there's still a lot of science that needs to catch up with how much we're interacting with fish and what our impacts are greatly as a collective community and on an individual basis. But that's been really helpful in terms of wrapping my head around, you know, especially in Maine, uh, we have a striped bass population that gets a lot of pressure up the Eastern seaboard. And I had the privilege of working with them on a campaign around how to best handle striped bass um, because they do get ca caught multiple times and we are catching them after a really, you know, often arduous trek up north to their feeding grounds. Um, I think something to keep in mind are the, the very small bits that you can be doing across the board, which is keeping fish in the water that's where they're breathing that's where they're living and not really taking them out of that water as much as possible 
um, not handling them too much. Fish have protective slime on the outside of their body. Which pretty much every kind of fish does. So using a net when you have that available to you or handling them really consciously about not removing too much of that. And then we also talked a little bit about the hooks that we're using. So um, using barbless hooks or where the hook itself is pinched. So it's just this one little piercing basically that they're getting. Um, and again, this is something that you can be practicing before you're out there on the water. So I have stuffed fish and when I'm teaching people how to catch fish and handle fish uh, in casting practice, we're going to hold the stuffed fish like we would uh, fish out in the wild and get really comfortable doing that because they're going to be moving around. They're going to be unpredictable and you can only do the best that you can do in that interaction. So preparing ahead of time um, is a really good way to be the best that you can be in that interaction of meeting a fish. I'll chime in just for a second, which is uh, another big one that you can look up is the conditions, your water conditions to find out the heat and, and how, so, so in places like in Montana in particular, they have things called hoot owl restrictions, which literally stop the time of day that you can fish based on river temperature and all of that for the protection of the fish. Um, but even if you live in a place that doesn't have those kind of restrictions, like Colorado has none of those, yet last summer when we were experiencing unprecedented heat and everything else, they asked for voluntary fish closer, closures. Like our CPW, our Colorado Parks and Wildlife, came and asked us to not fish between certain hours to protect the fish. So knowing that kind of stuff also about like the conditions of the time you're going out is to me, one of the most ethical things you can do. And then last thing, another gear thing really quick, just because obviously I love gear. There is a piece of gear that makes it so you don't have to touch the fish to take the hook out called the catchum. It's K-E-T-C-H-U-M. Um, it literally slides down your line to the hook, pops the hook out of the fish's mouth without you ever touching it. So you could literally have it in your net slide that tool down the line, pop the hook out and never actually put your hands on the fish if you didn't want to. So just thought I'd throw that out there. So we're just about at time. Um, if each panelist would like to speak to um, what their number one resource or advice um, to get started would be, um, and then we can, we can wrap it up. Gabachi, do you want to start? I was just going to offer all of this, the, the whole crew. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, reach out. Like, I think, I mean, I think there are tons of resources. It's hard to say that, like, one resource will answer all your questions in a way that's useful to you, to the waters that you're going to go fishing. So, like, definitely, hopefully your local game and fish has it together and they can be a resource. Your local fly shop. Yeah, not like the New Mexico one. Sorry, but we have some issues here um and uh, you know your local fly shop and then also yet yeah, your online community which now you're part of this community with the outcast anglers and confluence collective and tree line review so like know that we are resources like that's why we agreed to this panel and i'm always happy to answer questions so you send me a dm um i'll get to it whenever i can and i'm happy to share whatever i know i think for me it's also community and um continuing to to dig and read and not just be set on one way uh just like everyone does things different there's different ways to catch fish there's different flies there's different opinions and some fly anglers are very opinionated and welcoming to tell you exactly how it should be done and i encourage you to just keep seeking answers and asking questions of other things um reaching out is a great way to do it YouTube. I spend a lot of time watching people fish on YouTube, which kind of sounds funny, but um, that can be a good way to like look at um, the way people are casting or handling fish or um, trying to find a few people that feel safe and appropriate on, on the internet to follow in social media world. Yeah. And I think um, continuing along the, those same lines of like finding a buddy and finding different buddies uh, that you're comfortable with, because every time I'm out on the water with somebody else, we're both learning. Um, you know, I've been fishing for X number of years, but that doesn't mean that I'm not just continuing to learn. And I think really embracing that mindset is how you continue to improve and also how you can be a part of making this space more welcoming and accepting and 
you know, honest about how hard it can be and also about how wonderful it can be. Um, so finding more people and connecting. I can go next. Um, I guess just generally the best advice I could give, um, this actually kind of goes back to, um, a piece that uh, Kate actually shared about like getting into fly fishing and stuff. Um, he mentioned like, if you have like a spin casting rod, just like a traditional fishing reel, that kind of fishing setup. Um, I know my dad actually, he uses like a bobber and then um, maybe like a foot or so under that, he just attaches like a fly and he casts that out. I'm um, like a standard fishing rod. And I think that's probably one of the cheapest way you can kind of um, just get into fly fishing. Um, and he catches tons of fish and stuff. And he, now he's, he's looking at, um, uh, fly fishing rod. So just generally, if you're if you're kind of curious, but um, don't want to spend a whole bunch a whole bunch of money, you could probably spend like five eight bucks um, and try it out that way. But. Yeah, last thing for me, I just ditto to what everyone else has said already, which is there's so many awesome resources out there, and you would be surprised. I know this can be uh, an intimidating space and. Uh, but there are so many people that like literally just want like I'm one of those people that just wants to tell you everything that I can possibly tell you about fly fishing and happy to have you on board and caring about fish and our waterways and everything else I think that community finding that group of people is your best resource that you can do so Google's your friend Facebook Instagram can be your friends for those kind of things and so can the right fly shop so yeah, just try and find people that are excited to share it with you and help you learn on your journey. And if you want help finding more people, uh, look for events where you can be getting together with others. So we started a series called Outcast Anglers and Outcast Campouts, and we're going to be doing those all over the country eventually, uh, but in Maine and Montana this year. And if you're not sure where to even start looking, that's one spot. Um, but also just connecting on social is a good starting point as well. Uh, so thank you all for sharing that and also being part of that community. Thank you so much. A big round of applause to our five panelists. And thank you everyone for sharing your experiences and um, being open to answering questions. 